Tonight, chapter number 13, Hebrews chapter 13, and I'll try to not hold you long if I can help it tonight. Hebrews chapter 13, <clears throat> we certainly miss those that are not here, and uh, you know, you don't have to be the loudest one in church to be missed when you're gone. Amen. I know from this angle... When I look that way, if I see an empty spot where somebody usually sits, I feel that loss. And so we certainly miss those that are not here. And uh, praying for all of those that cannot be here for sickness and various reasons. And trust in the Lord to strengthen them and bring them on through. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 13. And I want to read one verse here, verse number 10. <clears throat> the Bible says here, We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. That little phrase, the first part of that, from the comma to backwards to the first part. We have an altar. I want to preach from that tonight if I can. Uh, an altar is one of those interesting English words. I, 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 they tell me now, I, I've tried to learn some foreign languages and I took some in school and I've even... Tried to look into some of that after that. I thought it would be beneficial in ministry to be able, if I went to another country, to speak some of their language. And they tell me that English is the hardest language on earth to learn. If that's the case, I must be exceptionally smart because I didn't have much trouble learning how to speak it. At least good enough that most hillbillies can understand what I'm saying. And I have not conquered Spanish. I've not conquered French, German. Nothing else that I've tried. They say they're easier to learn. I don't know. This one has been uh, relatively easy. But, but there, we have words in our English language that mean different things, but it's the same word. We have words in our English language like the word altar that uh, can be spelt two different ways but said exactly the same. One way is A-L-T-E-R, which means to make a change in or to differ it make it different in some way. You would alter a pair of clothes. Some something going clothes. You would do an alteration. You would alter it. You would you know if you came in here and, and drew a picture on that white spot in the wall. You would have altered the wall. It would be something that had been altered. But then the other word that is found here in the book of Hebrews is a l t a r, and that word alter simply means a high place, a place of sacrifice, a place of worship. A place of communion. That particular word is found 390 something times in the Old Testament alone. And uh, it appears like 162 times. It appears in a different way. And it, uh, the first word comes from a word that is spelled M I Z B E A, Miss Bea or Miss Bea. And, uh, and that, that is the altar that's mentioned. And then there's another. Uh, terminology that is used and it is it is spelled Z-A-B-A-H Zaba or Zaba and again that means altar but over 300 times near 400 times that the word altar is mentioned in the Bible it is one of the most common reoccurring words that we find in scripture amen the altar is a place of slaughter it's a place of sacrifice amen in Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 12 we find Noah building the first recorded altar. Amen. Find out where Noah comes out of the ark there after the ark has rested and the flood begins to go away. The waters go down. Noah and his family come out and they build an altar unto the Lord. And from then all the way through into the latter part of the book of Revelation, we find altars there. We find altars that are made of stone. We find altars of wood. We find altars of earth. We find altars of gold. We find altars that were to idol gods. We find altars to our God. We find altars that belong to a people. We find altars that belong in the temple. We find altars in the city. We find altars in the wilderness. We find altars in homes. We find altars just belonging to one person and to God. Amen. Altars, something that's extremely important. Read in the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, and you'll find the scriptures there where the priests put on clean linen breeches 
And he went and he stirred the wood on the altar. The fire that was kept there burning in the altar should never go out. You'll find the priest uh, putting in new wood every morning on the altar and then taking those ashes without the camp to a clean place. You'll find through the Old Testament that the priests visit that altar every morning and then they visit in the evening at the time of the evening sacrifice. It's a hallowed place. It's a place that demands reverence and a place that calls us to holiness before God. And the altar is something that in the Old Testament and under the law that was visited every day and most of the time twice a day. Not to mention the individual sacrifices throughout the day. But it seems like as we've come through the New Testament and into the church age and into the hour that we live in, it seems like the altar is the least visited church furniture. Praise God. People avoid the altar like I avoid a root canal. And seem like people don't want to go. We try to get folks to come pray at the altar. And there, you know, a lot of times you'll get a response like, I'm not backslidden. Well, I didn't think you was backslidden. We want you to come visit the altar so you won't backslide. Your folks say, I don't want to go to the altar. Everybody will think I'm lost. I said, I go to the altar so I won't be lost. The altar is the place where I find my way. The altar is the place where God directs me, where God deals with me. And the altar is the place where at times God chastens me. The altars are something that are beneficial, something that are consequential. They're something that is vitally necessary to every Christian life. And the writer here in the book of Hebrews said, we have an altar. The altar that looks like a, just a wooden bench here to us, we have one altar. Some churches have two altars. Some have another section or two of pews. They have extra altars. We've been to churches that had no altars. Never been into a more awkward church setting than to preach a message in the pulpit and call for men to come to meet God. And the meeting place is no longer there. Creates an awkward situation. We went to the funeral home to make arrangements for my aunt's passing. And her funeral and the homegoing celebration went yesterday with my cousins there. And the funeral home where... They made the arrangements where the funeral would be had is the church building that I grew up in. When the Kellyville congregation built a new facility, that other building it exactly sold went to another church group first, and then uh, that they didn't last there a long time, had some different issues, and then it ended up being bought by a funeral service. And so now the Sunday school room where I spent a many a Sunday listening to Brother Tom Whitehouse teach me the word of the Lord and where the Holy Ghost met us time after time is now the office of the undertaker. The Sunday school class that I went into is just a little bitty boy where Sister Joyce Whitehouse or my Aunt Sharon taught me in the little card class is now a state room where we sat to make arrangements. I walked through that building inside the sanctuary is the chapel for the funeral home and it looks much the same. There's some changes up around the front. But as far as you stand and look back at those pews, with the exception of a sound booth over this corner, it looks relatively the same as it did when I was a boy. There's been just a few changes here and there, but I showed some of them that was with us where I received the Holy Ghost. I said, right there under that pew, laying right under Brother John Romine's feet, right there. That's where I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I showed us it right here. There's no altars there, but I said, right there's where I got saved. My dad told some of me, he said, right there's where I got saved in 1971. Right here's where I prayed through. Amen. I said, right here's where I was dedicated. Sit right here on this altar. And a little bit, I said, right here's where I dedicated my children. Sit over here on this altar. But the altars are gone. We walked out and went into that stateroom there to make those arrangements with my cousins and their families. And there were those altars in that hallway out there that come out of that old church building. My dad felt like he figured out which was the men's and which was the women's. One had scratches all the way around it, probably from belt buckles of men leaning up over that altar. I can't guarantee that that is the one, but I know one of those is the one that I prayed at. I've been healed sitting on those altars. Amen. I want you to know tonight the altar is a wonderful opportunity for man to meet God. I've met God in the woods. I've met God in the barn. I've met God at home. Amen. I've met God on the pews. But I want you to know there
there is something sacred and special about the altar. It's somewhere that I go to and I show God by that going there that I want to meet you here. God never disappoints me at the altar. Amen. In the New Testament, Christ becomes the altar. There's no more temples. There's no more sacrifices. He becomes the ultimate sacrifice. The word altar that is used repetitively throughout the Old Testament is, is a place of sacrifice. In some places, it actually means sacrifice. Christ became the sacrifice. And because He became the sacrifice, He became our altar. Amen. Now, even though that old building that we'll have my aunt's funeral in, I'll stand very close to where I stood 29 years ago and preach my first message. I'll stand very close to that spot on Saturday morning and preach that part of my, my portion of that funeral. Very close to where I stood to preach my first message ever as a little preacher boy. Amen. Those altars are no longer used for altars like they were then. Amen. They're not used for that. But Christ became my abiding altar. Amen. I don't have to just have one place to go. I have an altar with me everywhere I go. And though I have that, it doesn't take away the importance of this wooden bench that adorns the front of our church house. The Bible stand is where the preacher preaches from. In the Old Testament, they wouldn't have stood at a podium. They would have stood by the altar to preach. That's where the message would have been brought from. That's where the priest stood. That's where he did most of his work was around the altar. No matter what I preach, no matter what my thrust is in a message, if I preach heaven, if I preach hell, if I preach joy, if I preach sadness, it doesn't matter. The end result at the end of every sermon that I preach across this Bible desk is to bring you to the altar. It's to bring you to that place where you can commune with God and have it more effectively in our life. And the writer here in the book of Hebrews said, we have an altar. Amen. What a wonderful proclamation tonight. I want you to know without an altar, my life would be very different. Without the altar, I would not be your preacher tonight. I would not be a preacher tonight for anybody if it was not for the altar. Amen. Aren't you thankful tonight that we have an altar? Aren't you glad? I've been to churches that were more modern. I've been to churches that had faded lighting. I've been to churches where they turned the, the, the house lights down and dimmed over the congregation while I preached and a spotlight shined on me. I've been to churches where as I preached they followed me with a light. Hey man, Sister Jean, they're beautiful. They're immaculate. They have unbelievable edifices. Hey Amen. But most of them don't have an old wood mourner's bench where the brokenhearted can go to, where the one can go to find an answer in those times of life of confusion. Hey Amen. They don't have that there. Hey Amen, brother and sister. I'm glad tonight for a little country church beside the road that still has an altar where men and women can find God. Thank you. Abraham built an altar almost everywhere he went. Lot, as far as I know from Scripture, never built one. He may have used Abraham's altar. If you would have walked up to Lot and smelled of him, he may have smelt like the smoke from Abraham's altar. But Lot didn't have an altar. And I want you to look tonight with me into the Word of God. I won't read all of it. I'm not even, I'm not even going to go through and quote it all. But you look at the life of Abraham, who became the friend of God. I didn't call him that. God called him that. Amen. The friend of God. Wouldn't that be a wonderful title to have? Amen. You call me Brother Justin or Sister Gail, normally says Brother Richardson. But I tell you, the greatest title I could have is somebody to say that man is God's friend. Abraham became that. He also became the father of the faithful. And brother, I believe it had something to do with the fact that everywhere Abraham went, and then before he put up a tent, before he built a corral for his herds, Abraham built an altar. Look at Lot's end. Look at the end of his family. I'm telling you, an altar is a very vital part of your successful 
precious experience. We read all through the scripture. Altars, altars, altars. Elijah repairs an altar. Abraham builds an altar. Gideon tears down the altars. Amen. He needed, those altars needed tore down. They were to another God. He wasn't tearing up this altar. Amen. I saw preachers. I may have done it. If I have, I can't recall right off the top of my head. I saw preachers crawl up on the altar bench preaching. I guess that's all right. I can't, I don't have, I'm not telling you it's a sin. Amen. I don't remember ever having stood on the altar bench in my mind. I can't remember it right off if I have. I watch guys get up on the altar and stomp and kick and carry on preaching. Amen. There's something down inside me when somebody, matter of fact, and Ben was talking to me one day and he said, Dad, what about brother so-and-so? Guys are always getting up on the altar and kicking and stomping and carrying on. He said, what are you going to do if he comes and preaches down there? I said, I'm telling you, there's something in me that cringes when somebody crawls up on top of the altar. Amen. I don't want the dirt off my feet. I don't want to scuff the top of it. Amen, brother. I'm telling you, it is important. It is a vital part. Oh, I tell you, we could take this altar and make firewood out of it and buy another one and put in here. It is not that piece of wood. Amen. But the fact that that's where, that as far as this congregation is concerned, that's our altar. That matters to us. Well, desecrate it. Don't do away with it. We had to move it for Brother John Ray's funeral service that day. I understood we had to move it. I'm not foolish. I'm not ignorant. I knew it had to be moved in order to place his coffin here, put the flowers up, have a memorial service. I understand that. But there was something in my heart. I was trying to get back to get it. Somebody had stopped me. And Brother Todd, and I don't know who all else was carrying it out that night. And there was something inside me. I can't describe it with vocabulary. I don't even know how to tell you. But as I watched that altar go out that door, there was something in me that just kind of cringed. I hate to see that altar moved. Amen. We may move it sometime when somebody's praying. Hey, man, but we're scooting. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's important. Yes. Yes. The day may come. These seats may get tore up. We might have to put new padding in the bottom of these seats. We've changed the pews. Matter of fact, the pews there in that building, the old Kellyville Church building, are not the pews I sat on as a child. The pews that I sat on looked just like these. Probably came from the same church furniture place. Had the same color seat padding. Says Virginia, identical pews to these. The altars there look just like this altar here does. And I know a lot of churches about that age, you know, had the same appearance of furniture in them. Amen. We may have to change a pew out. Amen. Something may happen and the altar may get broken or may get damaged. Could be a flood, a hurricane, a whirlwind, a tornado, fire. I don't know. Amen. But brother, don't ever be caught in life but without an altar. You need it. Thank you, Jesus. We need to visit it. It's important. There's been services where for whatever reason service went a different direction. We came around to dismissal without an altar service. And I dismissed you in the fear of the Lord. Prayed a prayer and we went out. But rarely do we close a service without visiting the altar. It's an important part of our Christian experience. It's not just a part of our Christian experience. It's a vital part of our victorious Christian experience. I've gone to the altar as a little boy. I've gone to the altar as a young man. I've gone to the altar. I don't know if I'm an old man or what now. I don't, I can't, I don't know where I'm at hardly. Amen. I, I do not feel like I felt 20 years ago. I want you to know I can tell the difference. My joints feel different. My throat feels different when I preach. Amen. My hair is changing. What little hair I've got left is changing swiftly to silver. There's highlighted silver around the edges of it. It's changing, brother. Really. It's going to change. My hair's going to turn white, it looks like. Whatever's left. Amen. But I have never outgrown the need for the altar. And I don't plan on it. So, 18 minutes or so after I walked into this pulpit and read you that verse. I want to give you the title of my message and for the next five minutes I want to preach to you on the foundation that I've laid. I know you see that saddle sitting there. 
It's obvious it's different. I wouldn't bring that saddle in. It's been on the back of a dirty horse. It's been washed. It's been cleaned. I've cleaned, we've cleaned under it and around it and through it and under the flaps on it. It's been washed. And I told Dad, I got down to his barn yesterday when I headed home. I told him a while ago, I said, Dad, he said, you're going to use that saddle to preach like you're telling me. I said, yeah. I said, I'll bring it back to you tomorrow. But I said, it's going to come back a whole lot different than it got on my pickup. I mean, it's been cleaned up. And even still, when it cleaned, wouldn't just bring it in here and set it on the altar. That's the altar. Yeah. That's the phone I use to get a hold of God. That's the bridge I use to cross the abyss of time and go to the throne of God. That's why there's a blanket under that saddle. I've heard people say over my life, and I know you probably have, well, if so-and-so would have just rode the altar, they would have made it. You ever hear anybody say that? I've saw people struggling. And I've heard preachers in little churches, big churches, eastern churches, southern churches, northern churches, western churches. I've saw a lot of preachers look somebody in the eye and tell them, you can make it, but you may have to ride the altar to get there. You can have the victory over that marriage. You can have the victory over that affliction. You can have the victory over that temptation, but you might have to ride the altar to get there. I've said it. I've heard other people say it. I've had to ride the altar. If I brought a saddle tonight. My little message title to this message, I want to just tell you, sometimes as a Christian, you need to cowboy up. That's my title tonight. Cowboy up. I looked it up today, in the, and yesterday maybe it was rather, in the Urban Dictionary. That's a new one that's went out since since uh, Webster's has, with all kind of new words in it and new phrases in it. And I looked up the words and they are on the Urban Dictionary and I typed in cowboy up. And the phrase cowboy up means when things get tough, get up. When things get up and tough, you dust yourself off. When things get tough, keep on trying. When things get tough, get back in the saddle. Cowboy up. And finish your job. Amen. So just for about two or three more minutes. I want to tell you. I may not make it with a victory. I may feel like I'm dragging blood. But brother if I got to put a saddle on the altar bench. And I got a cowboy up to make it. I plan on making it to heaven. Yes. I plan on serving God. I don't plan on falling by the wayside. If you're struggling in your faith. If you're weak in your experience. If and your resolve and then cowboy up. Amen. I got bucked off a horse as a youngster. I don't remember just how old I was. Got bucked off. You know what dad said? Get back on him. Yeah, get back on him. He didn't say it in those words, Sister Jean. He said, cowboy up. My little wrist was broken. I fell off that horse face first. My Palms went down. It's an old cactus that was growing. That bones in my arm, about right in here, there's still an indention. I can show you. Those bones broke, shoved up over one another. I mean, it's hurting. And Dad said, I went there. I was telling him I was hurting. I was crying. And Mom trying to tell me, Bob, he's hurt. He said, Son, you need to go get back in the saddle. You get old Prince. You bring him back up here. Don't you let him whoop you, son. You get back in the saddle. He was telling me. He was saying, Cowboy up, son. Amen. I've had the preacher look at me when tears running down my face. And I felt like he needed to hug me. I felt like he needed to call me a little bit. And he said, Get back in that altar. Amen. Get a straddle of the altar. And cowboy up. Amen. Listen, church, your life is rough. And life's going to deal you things you don't understand. Stand. It's going to hurt you and scar you. And the devil's going to fight you every step of the way. You need to cowboy up and get on the altar. Amen. I'm closing with this. Folks get in trouble. They get weak spiritually. Marriage in trouble. Young people struggling to keep the victory and serve God. You know what they don't do? They don't want to come to the altar. They'll get on social media, put a poll out to all their friends. You know, you think I ought to do this, you think I ought to do that. I'm those folks that are getting married. 
That's what they did. What do you think about me and her? And they go around and says, what do you think, sister? Are they going to marry that woman or not? They go around somebody else. I said, have you prayed about it? What does God think you ought to do about it? You know the most important thing in our life? Staying at the altar. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you're backslid. It means you want to do better. I want to make it. I'm not at the altar. Brother Paul normally prays right along in here. Brother Junior typically will pray right here or just to the end of the altar. There's been times the altar was full of people. Me, Brother Junior, just past the end of it, Brother Paul, Brother Todd, Brenton, Milan on this side, and start into the girls, be Alicia and Addison, Caroline, Sister Kristen, Jennifer usually long in here, Sister Debbie might be over here, Sister Jean usually would be at the end, but it got to where the altar's so full, I've noticed she's been praying at the old cane bottom chair over here. She's not avoiding the altar, she, and just Brother Junior told me, he said, Brother Justin, the altar's getting so full. And he said, sometimes I may be over here in the floor. He's telling me, I just want you to know, I don't remember his exact word. And he said, I'm not trying to avoid the altar. I just want you to know it's getting so full. I, I had to scoot on down. Brother Bill prays over there at that pew usually. Amen. But somewhere in this field, you understand what I'm saying? Not necessarily just right here. It might be at that chair, maybe at a step over here. But when I need help from God, I go to the altar. Amen. I've never thought... As I looked at you lying down this altar, I've never assumed that Sister Jean was praying there because she was vaccinated. Never assumed. Brother Paul, Brother Junior, they're down here praying. They've, they've got drinking problems and gambling problems and they're beating up on their wives. I've never, I've never have thought that. It didn't cross my mind. You know why I thought you was here? Well, that's what Christians do. You know why I go to the altar? Because that's the way I talk to God. And I want you to know tonight, if you're struggling, if you're dealing with things you don't understand, if you feel like your whole world, I've been there. My world's out of control. And there's been times, I don't know if this may not be wisdom, but there's been times that I've been better off. You just put me a saddle on the altar and just have church from right there. You'd be better off. Bring you a cushion or a saddle and cowboy up and sit on this altar every night. And you wouldn't have sat in that pew and backslide. I told Jennifer and the girls, I said, I'm going to preach Thursday night. I said, I'm going to wear my boots, tuck my britches legs in them. I'm going to wear my spurs. And I'm going to sit straight on the altar and preach. But I was afraid I couldn't sit here that long and preach to you for 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> but if i got to ride at the altar, I have to make it. Yeah. I must make it. Brother Junior got touched that night and got healed. You know where it happened? We had some people, we had that chair here for a while, moved the chair. We were trying to do away with church history or tradition or anything. We just needed more room at the altar. So we scooted the chair over. Do you know where you get healed? Right here. You know where the river flowed in the book of Ezekiel? Around the altar. And they come on the south side of the altar and they float around that altar. That's where the river flowed. You know where I got the Holy Ghost? Walking around the altar. You know where I got sanctified? The altar. You know where I got saved? The altar. You know where I... Made my vows to my wife, the altar. He wasn't the one in the church, and another said, another week, that altar. Altars are important. If I got a cowboy up, and you say, well, you look pretty foolish sitting up there on a the saddle in the middle of your wooden horse, but I'd rather go to heaven sitting here on this saddle and you laughing at me yeah. and sit back there and lose out with God and lose the victory. Does that make any sense tonight? That's just a saddle, it's just a wooden bench. But whatever I've got to do, you've got to cowboy up and serve the Lord. Yes. And there's times, have you ever been bucked off? You better believe I have. I've been bucked off that horse. I've been bucked off a rocket horse. And I said, little boy, I fell off in and got hurt. I got bucked off a stick horse. You know how you get bucked off a stick horse? I got tangled up over my own feet and my stick horse threw me. The next thing I knew, me and the stick horse was down and my stick of my horse was broke plumb in two. I broke the horse's back when I fell. You ever been bucked off spiritually? Sad to tell you, but I have. I sure have. I grew up listening to saints at the church tell, and I'm done. I told you I was closing four minutes ago. I grew up listening to saints tell. I don't remember it. If I was there, I was a little bitty boy. 
It may have happened before my time. They told about Brother Edwards in church one night. I don't know what was going on. I don't know what was troubling that great man of God. And I grew up respecting and loving, and I still do today. I honor his memory today. Maybe did you get saved in a, was Brother Edwards preaching camp meeting, or was that Phyllis or somebody? No, but, me and Phyllis both got saved right here at the old Empire Church when Brother G.W. and Sister Fern was preaching. Brother G.W. Yeah. I forgot who it was the other day. I was thinking it was one of y'all told me. Somebody just the other day told me got saved. Brother Edwards was he preaching. Preached, the, he preached camp meeting. Athens camp meeting, yeah. Camp yeah. Camp Somebody's telling me they got I, saved. I went back to my grandpa and talked to him, trying to get him to pray. But, you know, he felt like he's all right. I don't know what was happening. Yeah. I don't know what was going on with Brother Edwards. He was the pastor of a very large, successful church. He was the chairman of the Bristow Camp Meeting, the founder, him and Brother Ari Roberts. I don't know what was going on with him, but I've heard many, many, many different saints testify about Brother Edwards getting up one night, maybe put his guitar down and walked up to the banister that used to sit at the front of the pulpit on the railings there, walked down to the altar crying and said, saints, I need some help, and just fell across that altar weeping. I don't know what was wrong with him, but I've heard him tell about the saints gathering around Brother Edwards and praying. And Sister Gail, I've saw many men and women get up and go to the altar in the middle of service and pray and get help from God and testify. So I remember when Brother Edwards did that. And I felt that way tonight. I just needed some help, saints. And they'd go to the altar because Brother Edwards went to the altar. I wrote up here in that. And so there's been times as a preacher, as a husband, as a father, as a Christian. And I had to stand up and say, Saints, I just need some help tonight. And I went to the altar and wept and I cried. And said, well, did somebody think you backslid? They may have. I don't know. They didn't tell me if they did. It didn't matter. Had a cowboy up. I wanted to preach to us on a Thursday night. If you've got to put a saddle on the altar and ride it to glory, don't fall by the wayside because you avoided the place of contact with God. Praise God. Let's stand tonight. I ain't much preaching. It's been on my heart. There's a lot of folks that would have made it.